So last week was a tense one, I think, for all of us. The trade talks had broken down. The press here in the U.S. was filled with doom and gloom, and the stock market plummeted. I was in Shanghai last week. Uh, our bank, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, I've been there for 30 years now. We have a joint venture bank in Shanghai, and I uh, go every quarter for the board meetings and spend a week or two trying to gather information, what people are thinking. Everybody I know in Shanghai wanted to talk about the trade war. All were looking for some reason to be hopeful. I think most of us agree here in the U.S. and also in China, the trade war hurts all of us. That said, this trade war, or something like it, has been a long time in coming. Last year, friends of ours, I say ours, my wife Ruth is in the second row. Last year, friends of ours announced their decision to divorce after 49 years of marriage. Like the trade war, this divorce had been a long time in coming. <laughs> First, these two people, each more or less de delightful in their own right, had never really been fully compatible. In addition, the grievances had been piling up for decades. Whatever he did wrong, it was in response to something she'd done. Whatever she'd done, it was in response to something he'd done. No one had any idea who'd thrown the first stone. Both insisted that the other had done it and neither had any idea how to break out of this syndrome. In my view, there's a similar dynamic between China and the U.S. The U.S. and China's respective systems have aspects, at least, that are incompatible, and the grievances have been piling up for years. I would like to give you a small but indicative example from my own life in the spirit of setting the stage. The bank that I've been working for for these past 30 years, Silicon Valley Bank, as I said before, has a joint venture bank in China, half owned by us, half owned by the Chinese government. It's already a decade old, and it's making progress, not as much as we would like it to, but progress. And there are grievances, and these grievances have been piling up for years. Further, our respective systems, in many respects, are not quite compatible. For example, the U.S. regulators, and I assume there aren't that many bankers in the audience tonight, so I'll give a tiny bit of background. U.S. regulators let banks in the U.S. fail on a regular basis. If they take on too much risk and they can't handle that risk, they end up failing. We have 8,000 banks in the U.S. When I got started in my career 35 years ago, we had 18,000. About half of the missing 10,000 were acquired. The other half failed. They just went under. Our business model at Silicon Valley Bank is based on our ability to manage risk, specifically the risk inherent in early stage technology companies. Here in the US, that serves us well. We compete well. In China, it's much more difficult. I don't know if you know why. It's not because our competitors are better. It's because the banks in China are more or less insulated from risk. No matter how much risk they take, and no matter how poorly they manage it, the most that happens is that they get balled out, maybe even fired, or at least they have to write a self-criticism. <laughs> That's true, but they don't go under. The government recapitalizes them. 
Since the CCP came to power in 1949, virtually no Chinese bank has failed. As you can see, our expertise is of little value in a system that works like that. I give you one other example, and that is when a foreign bank gets a license to do business in the U.S., and in 2012, the U.S. government, through its regulators, gave, um, gave licenses to three Chinese banks to do business. When a foreign bank or gets a license to do business in the U.S., I'm talking about commercial banks now, they're entitled to do any of the business that any of the other 8,000 banks do. They are licensed, basically, to do anything that a commercial bank can do. Naively, I should have studied the problem more in advance. Naively, I didn't know that when we went to China. So we worked very hard at getting our license, and after several years of hard work, we were granted the license, and then we set up our bank, which took a full year, and in the process of setting up the bank, I learned shame on me, that the license only granted us the right to open the doors <laughs> and to greet customers. Then we needed a separate license to take deposits. Then we needed a separate license to make loans, actually a different license for each type of loan, and there are myriad types of loans. Then we needed a license to have a website, and we needed a separate license to... Uh, to conduct business over the website. You know how you go to the website with your bank, whatever it is, and you make deposits or you withdraw money or you transfer money or something? Uh, all those require separate licenses. And by the way, the one for doing business with a website, you have to be in business for a year before you can get that license. But of course, during that year, nobody wants to do business with you because you can't access your accounts over the website. And so it goes. It just so happens that now, after a decade, we're still missing some of the essential licenses. Uh, so I'm not quite sure when we'll have them, but I don't think it's going to be soon. When I complain to friends and acquaintances in China, the response is predictable. It's usually... Every country protects itself. That's all we're doing here in China is protecting ourselves in the same way that other countries protect themselves. And then after that, the grievances. And there are myriad grievances. They start all the way with uh, the Opium Wars of 1842. <laughs> For, for which I personally take almost no responsibility. <laughs> I've actually never even tried opium. I don't know if I'd recognize it. And they extend to, well, the list goes on and on and on. And I'm sure that all of you are familiar with the list. But there are countless injustices to which China can point some perhaps more real from my perspective than others, but all having a definite reality, at least in the minds of the people who are recounting them. Well, I'm not sure where that got us, but at least I've set the stage. Tonight we have a real a cast of real experts. We have Frank Wu. We have Buck G, we have Andy Rothman, we have Victor Wong, we have Mark Cohen. We've tried to select our speakers in a way that all points on the spectrum would have representation. Those who empathize with China and those who criticize China, and then of course those who are just like me in the middle of the spectrum. <laughs> Don't we all think we're in the middle? of the spectrum. 
So I'd like to just uh, invite the panel to come up, and while they're doing that, I want to introduce Frank, and Frank can introduce the others. Frank, the ringleader, he's the current president of the C-100 and a distinguished professor at Hastings, where he also served as dean and chancellor. I was super impressed until I learned they're the same thing at Hastings. <laughs> but I'm still impressed. And he, Frank has done so many other impressive things that I'm going to stop there and allow him time to introduce his panel. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ken. Uh, Ken and I have in common uh, roots in Detroit, the Motor City. I'm just a kid from Detroit. Uh, let me acknowledge another Committee of 100 member, Dan Chow, seated uh, at the front, who also knows all about licensing. Uh, for a decade, under the direction of Bill Gates, uh, he set up uh, the next generation of nuclear power plants uh, in China, and it took a decade uh, to work out all of the licensing for that. So that's a story that uh, I think many in the room uh, can share. Allow me uh, to share just a little bit of background about Committee of 100. We have partnered with Asia Society in the past, and we look forward to partnering with Asia Society in the future. A nonprofit based in New York City, we were founded by the late I.M. Pei, who passed away just a week ago at 102, with his friend Yo-Yo Ma and four other Chinese Americans. 30 years ago, they decided to create a leadership organization that would welcome distinguished persons of Chinese ethnic background and U.S. citizenship at the encouragement of Dr. Henry Kissinger, who said to his friend I am at a cocktail party in New York City that we could play a unique bridge-building role. And that's what we've done ever since. With cultural affinity, yet as loyal Americans sitting on the American side of the table, we're pleased to present this conversation. Just a reminder, everything here is on the record, so as you ask questions, please do be aware that we're recording in the back and this will be streamed on the web. That's also a reminder to all of our speakers. Allow me uh, to set the stage. We'll then hear from four subject matter experts, and we'll open the floor for conversations. It's great to see a full house today on such an important subject. Ever since more than two generations ago, Glenn Cowan, the ping pong player, failed to catch his bus. Many of you remember the days of ping pong diplomacy. It got its name because a lanky Californian, a champion here in the U US at table tennis, somehow carelessly didn't board the American team bus. Invited by his Chinese competitors to join them on their team bus, this fortuitous accident of scheduling gave them the opportunity to talk back and forth and from there to invite officials to join the dialogue. Times have changed from those moments and then later when President Jimmy Carter in 1979 normalized, uh, normalized US-China relations with the Shanghai communique. We were all filled with so much hope then. Fast forward just 40 years, two generations, you heard from my friend Margaret some of the headlines. You may also know that best-selling books by Graham Allison about the so-called Thucydides trap. Many of you uh, weren't aware of the Greek philosopher general who said when you have a rising power and an established power in almost all, but not all cases, you have war. So people are talking in ways that they haven't in so long, in a time of anxiety and uncertainty we will hear from four individuals who will explain to us where we are headed, what the possibilities are, and how each of us in this room, in our own way, can build bridges. Our speakers are Buck G. He's the board president of the Angel Island Immigration Station, serves on the board of Ascend, the board of Asia Society Northern California, numerous boards. Uh, Buck has failed retirement. He is a <laughs> senior executive in his past life with Cisco. 
We also have Andy Rothman, investment strategist at Matthews Asia, also a member of Asia Society Northern California's advisory board, principally responsible for developing research focused on China's ongoing economic and political developments, and has just returned from Beijing, Shanghai, and Hangzhou. We have Victor Wong, founding and managing partner of CEG Ventures in Palo Alto. Uh, he's been in charge of the Silicon Valley VC fund management, Silicon Valley investment projects for China equity as well. Finally, uh, just arrived, we have Mark Cohen, delighted uh, to see that he was able to make it, senior fellow and director of the BCLT Asia IP project, 30 years of experience uh, in law, formerly senior counsel and senior advisor to the Undersecretary of Commerce and the director of the US PTO, widely recognized as one of America's leading experts on intellectual property in China. So we'll start here uh, with Andy Rothman. Each speaker will offer three to five minutes to open. Then we'll engage in dialogue before we hear from all of you. Shall we start? Thank you, Frank. And thanks to the Committee of 100 and the Asia Society for hosting us. Thank you all for coming today. Um, what I'd like to do is just throw out five points that I think are sometimes missing or misunderstood in the conversation about U.S.-China relations. And I'm not going to go into any detail on any of them because we can do that during the discussion part of this. But to start with, I think it's important to remind people that China is not the USSR. Now, that might strike some of you as a weird thing to have to point out. But if you listen to the conversations in Washington today, it often sounds like and in fact, many people in Washington are saying that this is worse than the USSR. But I think the main point I'd make there is that while the Soviet Union wanted to blow up and replace the system of global governance that the United States largely created after World War II, China just wants to outcompete us within the system that we built. That's a very different scenario. The second point is that, in my view, there's a lot of serious problems remaining, not the least of which are all of Ken's licenses uh, in the US-China relationship. But I think even Ken would agree that progress has been made through engagement between the two sides, engagement between governments, between students, between universities, between companies. And that, I think, reflects that the way to solve the remaining problems is through engagement rather than starting a Cold War-like or confrontational relationship. The third point I want to make is that Reciprocity is not the answer. You may have heard that a lot of people, again, I don't want to pick on Washington, but I'm going to. Uh, <laughs> and, and one of the reasons I'm singling out Washington is my experience from traveling around the US and speaking to groups is that the anti-China sentiment that we see in Washington is, which is bipartisan, by the way, doesn't seem to me to be present in most of the rest of the country. We're hearing some people saying, let's apply reciprocity to China. If the Chinese government doesn't allow enough of our journalists to work in China, let's kick out some of their journalists. If they don't allow our researchers to get access to all the archives, let's do the same thing to them here. My simple response to that is, we should be above all of that. Fourth, we need to resolve a fundamental question. What kind of relationship does the United States want to have with China 40 years from now? Do we want to stop them from rising, a process they're well into now, economically, strategically, politically, prevent them from sharing the world stage with us, something that seems to me to be really difficult to accomplish? and probably counterproductive for us? Or do we want to use the leverage we have in the engagement process that we've built across so many different parts of the relationship to keep pushing them in the right direction so that we can share power with them in a constructive way? And I think that we're not even close to, never mind answering that question, but I don't even think that discussion has begun in Washington. And then the last point I want to make is that I think we need to regardless of our view of how to answer that question I just raised. We need to push back hard on people who are either deliberately or accidentally talking about the problem of US-China relationship 
in a way that's tinged with racism and xenophobia. Uh, uh, you're probably aware of some of the recent examples. Um, one of my favorites is from the director of policy planning at the State Department, uh, Dr. Skinner, who recently said that one of the unique parts of the challenge that we face with China is that China is the first competitor that is not Caucasian. Uh, the FBI director, Christopher Wray, has on a couple of occasions publicly said that effectively all students from China must be spies. <laughs> Newt Gingrich is writing a book about China. He wrote that before we can fix our approach to China, we must change our view of China. We must accept that the Chinese have a deep commitment to being Chinese. <laughs> so I, I think it's important that we call out people, and, and some of this may be benign, it may be accidental, but we need to call out people who veer off into racism and xenophobia because that runs the risk of reawakening the kind of dark parts of our society, the parts that were responsible for the Chinese Exclusion Act in the late 1800s, uh, the parts of our society that were responsible for the executive order in 1942, which resulted in incarceration of Italian Americans, German Americans, Japanese Americans, and we need to be really aware and I think on guard that we don't see this discussion of a debate about the Chinese government drift into a conversation about Chinese, which then becomes, I think, heading towards racism and xenophobia. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Our next speaker, Victor. This on? Hello. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to uh, add to Andy, um, uh, basically my, myself, uh, I have a lot of friends in China. I, uh, as you know, uh, most of the Chinese today use WeChat groups. I'm probably in 20 some groups involved uh, various circles in China. Uh, yesterday, there's a one news was uh, like uh, explosive. Uh, just one line, truce of trade war, deal made. Everybody's uh, 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 forwarding and uh, copying the same news. A few hours later, uh, the official news said, oh, uh, sorry, this was uh, last year, exactly the same date last year. Uh, but this shows that uh, you know, people in China wanted uh, some deal to be made, uh, very clearly. Uh, I, I think probably say, same here. Uh, what's concerned myself is that uh, since the date of uh, uh, Trump declared the, the breakup of the uh, uh, negotiation. Uh, Chinese government ordered the uh, CCTV to broadcast uh, Korean, Korean War uh, movies in the golden time, uh, starting uh, indoctrinating people to sort of uh, prepare for the modality. That really concerns me. Uh, uh, this action itself, of course, was very controversial in China. Many uh, people, including uh, elites, uh, don't think it's the right thing to do. But as you can see, if this uh, uh, deal is not made or, or this uh, negotiation uh, uh, is broken, uh, my biggest concern is uh, China will go back to uh, what it was before 40 years ago. Uh, so that is not uh, to the best benefit of Chinese people, neither to the uh, US people, because you don't want to see a world uh, like a Korea only with the 10,000 times more nuclear arsenal. That's the worst scenario for, for the world. So uh, I, I think the reason a lot of people want to, uh, to the deal to be made is that they want to see a continuously open and reform the society, want to see China to be part of the world. I think this is uh, still, as of today, officially uh, the official stance, but, uh, uh, but that's certainly one of the concerns. 
Another major thing in the last few days was uh, um, embargo to Huawei. And uh, uh, of course, all the technology circle are highly concerned about the uh, event. Uh, as, as we know, uh, today's uh, globalized supply chain are highly intertwined. And if you, uh, e you want to make a mobile phone, if you're missing one component, you're not going to be able to make it. So this will, uh, if, if US is applying uh, the embargo to Huawei as it did to Zhongxin about a few months ago, certainly will create huge, huge uh, difficulty for uh, Huawei as a company. And, and uh, 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 President Xi Jinping visited the, one of the rare earth element company in Jiangxi province yesterday. And the people's reading, although this is not official, but people's trying to interpret this, is that China can use uh, rare earth element as a counter uh, measure. Because 90% uh, of a rare earth element was produced in China. And uh, as we know, all the military, a lot of the semiconductor, high tech, electronics need a tiny bit of uh, rare earth elements. So, uh, you know, that's the sort of pass nobody want to see, right? Uh, and the uh, escalation of embargo, escalation of, uh, um, uh, uh, of the trade war. Not the trade war. This is a beyond trade war. It's a, uh, so what I, uh, I can see is there's a non-zero or fairly large probability that the global chain who has been already intertwined in the last 40 years will be torn apart uh, artificially, forcefully. And uh, as you can see, after uh, uh, the 10% of the tariff uh, imposed in Chinese goods, many Chinese companies or uh, Japanese or Taiwanese companies already moved their factory from China to Vietnam. Uh, today, what I heard is uh, the land price in Saigon is already uh, same as Beijing's land price 10 years ago. It's very expensive, probably uh, more expensive than most of the places in America, probably com comparable to San Jose, because so many companies are going to uh, Vietnam to set up a factory to avoid this uh, uh, tariff. So uh, if, if the US continue uh, be down to this path, of uh, you know, blocking Huawei, maybe other technology companies. That already, I think after Zhongxin event, Chinese government already made their mind. We have to develop our entire ecosystem, all the way from chips, from uh, uh, EDA, uh, electronic design software, from uh, lithographic machine, the entire, basically China need to build their own, all the way from applied material to Intel to uh, you know, Microsoft. Uh, I, I think that is already made. Uh, uh, whether uh, you retrieve back from this decision of embarking Huawei or not, I think that's our of official decision already. So the results will be the world will have a two technology standard, China versus the uh, rest of the world. And maybe China can uh, entice uh, Belt and the Road countries also adopted the system, maybe some other uh, Asian, uh, even European countries. But uh, there will be two technology standard. And that is not to the benefit of uh, anybody. So that's uh, my concern. And uh, it seems to me that uh, uh, this, you know, global, it's like a, two twins who have a joint body parts. Now you are trying to tear them apart, okay? There's gonna be a lot of bleeding and pain and uh, 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 only require uh, extremely precision surgery in order to not to kill uh, both babies. So uh, I, I think uh, as a technologist and the investor, I think that's one thing we can see almost for sure for the next 10 to 20 years in the coming. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Buck. Hi. <clears throat> so I'm Buck G, and I'm American. You know, and, and since we're recording this, you know, for the record, that's never been a question. <laughs> I married to a woman with good Midwestern German stock. <laughs> 
I've raised three kids in Palo Alto, and they're, they're great kids. I've done a lot of successful startups and made a lot of venture capitalists a lot of money. Um, my last uh, company was acquired by Cisco, and um, we made 200 um, new millionaires in that acquisition. Um, but if I visit my old village in China and see my second cousin twice removed, um, if I get a call from an FBI agent who asks, what are you doing in China? Um, I'm not offended, actually. Um, I get it. They have, their, they have their, their issues they have to deal with, security. It's a real issue. I am offended, though, that they may take my answers and look for more and assume more and make mistakes. Because they have made mistakes. And the, what we've seen in cases in the last couple of years is when they make mistakes, they don't admit those mistakes, and they move on. So there's no penalty for being wrong, you know, because for, for them, they don't miss anybody. So that offends me, because even though I'm an American, to them, I'm not. To them, I'm somebody else. Somebody that they think I am, not who I know I am. And, and that's the problem that I see. There is a problem with U.S.-China relationships, and um, both companies are making mistakes. That affects the relationships, not between China and U.S. only, but with the U.S. and its citizens. As I said, I'm a citizen, and that affects my relationships with my government in a way that is not getting better as the relationships with the U.S. and China gets worse. So we raise the issue, certainly the Committee of 100 raises the issue, that, um, that the government has its job, but uh, it, has an, it has to understand its effect on us. And it, when it makes mistakes, admit those mistakes. And that's what we don't see happening. Our uh, last opening uh, statement for Mark. Thank you. Hopefully I can wrap up some of what other people said uh, in, in my brief comments. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm an IP guy, and uh, uh, I'm happy dealing with PhDs and geeks. I'm happy dealing with PhDs and geeks and, uh, uh, you know, concerned about how to draft a, a patent claim for a pharmaceutical invention or a semiconductor invention. And how did these issues all of a sudden morph into a trade war? And how does it become a Thucydides trap and maybe even a hot war? It's astounding that something that began so technical and so small that, you know, 10,000 PhDs at the USPTO where I worked at 13 years, the issues that we worked on somehow are related to these massive issues involving uh, debarring Huawei from the market and the South China Seas, persecutions of Chinese Americans. It's really remarkable. When this whole process began, I thought of it, maybe this is a pretext. Maybe we're just using IP as a pretext for something else. After all, you may not be aware of it, but China has improved its IP environment quite a bit. Uh, and they improved it even more under US pressure from the, from the sanctions. The China is the most biggest patent office in the world. And it's, uh, in fact, bigger than the, uh, all the other patent offices in the world combined. And not only that, for those of you who think that, oh, those are all foreigners, foreigners play a very small role in this environment. In some areas, less than 2% of the patents are granted to foreigners. So this is an overwhelmingly Chinese environment. They have a new specialized IP court, great judges. They have a lot of IP faculties. They have an IP newspaper. This is, this is heaven for a guy like me. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love going to China to talk about it because actually, a lot of people in the Valley uh, in the Bay Area, kind of not so crazy about intellectual property. You know, what, what's this? <laughs> software patents, what do we need that for? We, you know, let's make sure that courts don't always grant injunctions. Let's weaken our pharmaceutical patents. You know, it's all related to pricing. China is really jazzed up on this issue. So this is kind of, like, kind of weird. So that, but then, on the other hand, you have to realize that in a certain sense, if it's a pretext, maybe it's a long overdue set of issues. You know, we only filed, before President Trump, uh, we only filed one WTO case against China. 
you read the press and people say, oh, we've been dealing with this for years. China never listens to us. Look at all the WTO stuff. One case, I was involved in it. And, and by the way, it had nothing to do with technology. <laughs> Zero. 2007, it was about copyright piracy and trademark counterfeiting and what customs has to do in criminal enforcement. In fact, it had nothing to do with civil enforcement of intellectual property. It was about criminal and customs remedies. So don't believe the media on this. We haven't been dealing with this. In fact, an issue I worked on for almost 20 years involving China's intellectual property licensing environment went nowhere because no one in the US government was that interested. And if you want further proof, 2002, we were so disinterested in trade secrets, this issue that now seems to be targeting Chinese Americans, economic espionage, that when I told USTR we were reviewing China's accession to the WTO, I said, someone should raise questions about trade secrets. And they said, well, you do it, Mark. I, mean, I wasn't in USTR. I said, okay. And I told them, by the way, my computer is broken today. When I type trade secrets, there's a space missing between the T and the S. Could you please correct it? They were so disinterested, it went in uncorrected. You can go to the WTO website. <laughs> so, so, so this is really, you know, okay, pretext, long. These issues are important. Don't get me wrong. These are extremely important issues. We always, always should have been focused on China's emergence as a technological superpower. You know, th this was just the fact that Washington responds to, to in industry complaints and people were more concerned about Louis Vuitton and, and other issues than they were about uh, China's emergence as, as a technological superpower. So in that sense, I'm actually happy that people are focusing on the issues that I care about. But then we get to this third observation, okay? Pretext long overdue, maybe our reaction is excessive. And this, I differ a little bit uh, with this targeting of Chinese uh, on economic espionage cases. I agree there seems to be targeting, but I also would disagree to the extent that you tell an FBI agent, go investigate a physicist at Temple University. I think he's sending technical information to China. I don't know what kind of physicist he was. He doesn't understand physics. I mean, these issues have been so dumbed down you know, he said, oh, he's shipping documents over to China. It later, later turned out to be open source documents, you know. And, and so uh, if, you, if you turn loose a security guy on the PhDs that I deal with, it's not a good match. <laughs> you know, and that is part of the problem we're living in. It's not only trade secret prosecutions. It's controls of a Chinese investment in the U.S., emerging and foundational technologies. So that's what we're pursuing now. What does that mean? Does that have anything to do with military? You know, a sextant is a precursor to GPS. Is that a foundational technology? You know, an improvement to a sextant? I mean, where does this stop? And the, so the potential intrusiveness into commercial transactions, into people's lives, and export controls, now we have Huawei as a target. And of course, a lot of us, myself included, wonder, well, is this about Huawei's ability, a, a backdoor that hasn't been identified? Or is this about 5G and the threat posed by 5G? Or is this something else? And, and I guess I, I wonder a, a great deal, and I'm concerned about this something else. Because when I saw that the trade negotiations were paused, and of course the immediate reaction is this Huawei thing and rare earths, which by the way has been the subject of several WTO cases involving China, I said this is no longer a trade negotiation. If it was a trade negotiation, you, you, you reap what you've accomplished thus far, and perhaps you put off some other issues to another day. And if you really are, can, if you really are a little bit mean, as the Trump administration is being a little pushy, maybe you could say we're going to monitor this very carefully. But OK, we've accomplished a lot. Let's see how this rolls out. But if you look at the subsequent reactions, you look at how the security issues are wrapped up in it, you have to wonder whether this is well, it's probably no longer about IP and the geeky people I deal with. It may no longer even be about the trade deficit and trade. It may be something much bigger that's in the minds of the folks in Washington. So those are the opening statements. We'll now open uh, for conversation. If any of the panelists would like to ask another panelist a question, that's fine. And in about 15 minutes, we'll open to the audience. Uh, let me start Can with- Can I respond to him for just a second? 
Sure, uh, of course, Buck. Sorry, just just the, the comment about the, the, the temple professor. I, I, I agree with you. The FBI agents don't know, but what happened was even after they found out, they pursued the case. And that, that's the thing that I don't like, the thing that scares me as well, and, 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 and what I tell my engineering friends at, in Silicon Valley. No, I fully understand, but I, 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 I'm just saying that there's another element, too, where these issues have really been uh, oversimplified, which en energizes people to pursue cases, and they may very well but have That's right. As I say, they, they had absolutely every, every right to, to ask the question, what are you, do, what are you sending? The question, they, they didn't, when they found out what it was, they didn't care. Well, so, okay, this is, this is where I get my IP hat is. We hear a lot about IP theft. And by the way, go to the FBI website and see what it says about IP theft. And if you want to, you can compare it to what that, was, what that meant 10 years ago. The term is completely morphed. Okay, so don't think there's a consistent engagement on these issues. But, but, but can you give an example? Tra okay, well, I mean, the trade secrets were not part of that discussion when the f term first appeared. But the other thing is trade secret cases are extraordinarily hard cases to prosecute. Okay, so, so I, I'm going to exercise uh, the moderator's sure. responsibility. One, just one, one All right, last comment for two seconds, yeah. and then we'll, we'll move on from this subject. You can return to it if, if there are additional questions. Only because Cisco was sued Huawei uh, while I was there. You know, it's hard to believe that you could write a million lines of code out of the same bugs as Cisco. It's hard to believe you could have a 100-page document documentation and the same typos in the documentation. <laughs> so, um, but it was ultimately settled because on the one hand, there was a problem, but on the other hand, China is a potentially huge market for Cisco. Okay. So you have to deal with it. So, so that shows some of the complexities. Let me ask the, <laughs> the panelists a, a question by way of a story. So I'll tell a very short story. And let me know if you think this story is accurate or inaccurate and which part. So for a long time, the conventional understanding was that China, through constructive engagement with the United States and the West in general, would become more open, would become more like the United States, would uh, have maybe even a free press, would have intellectual property protections. It would come to resemble the rest of the world. In the past 18 to 24 months, a consensus has emerged, not just uh, from the White House, but bipartisan, that that narrative turns out to be mistaken. That for whatever reason, whether uh, naivete on the American side or malice on the Chinese side, that uh, actually China did not, according to this new story, become more open and more like America. So what is your sense of this new understanding, this interpretation? Uh, any panelists should feel free to jump in. Why don't I turn to my uh, right, your left, though, since we've heard uh, from uh, our two panelists here. Yes, back to you, Andy. I, I, I enjoyed that back and forth anyway. But, uh, um, I, I think this is uh, a really key point, and it gets back to one of the things that I was talking about before about engagement, because uh, I find that when I talk to people in Washington who say, I've given up on engaging with China, I've given up on negotiating and talking with China, because back in the 1990s, when we were negotiating with them to give them permanent MFN and get them into the WTO, we were promised that by now, 15 years, China would become a liberal Western democracy, just like America. Yeah, I laughed too. And I'm thinking, I participated in that process. I don't remember anybody ever telling anyone that that was the objective. In fact, the objective was to open up the market. And then people say, well, but Bill Clinton said. I said, well, Bill Clinton went to you in 1996 or 1997 and said, in 15, 20 years, China is going to be a liberal Western democracy, just like us. You should have slapped him. There was no reason for you to believe that. But more importantly, the argument that nothing has changed is just one that you can only make if you've never been to China and never read anything decent about China. Uh, you know, just on the economic side, uh, when I first started working in China, there were no private companies at all. You couldn't even find a privately run restaurant. Now, 
85% of urban employment in China is with small entrepreneurial private companies. All the new job creation is that. When I started working in China, I had to get ration coupons to buy meat and cotton and cooking oil. Now almost all prices are set by the market. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that they haven't done that they've committed to under the WTO, and we need to keep pushing on that. But if they've made no changes at all, how is it that GM is selling almost 4 million cars a year in China, more than they sell in the United States? Last year, Cadillac sales were up 30%. First time ever, Cadillac sold more cars in China than it did in the United States. Um, you've got companies ranging from Apple to Nike, Tesla, NVIDIA, Dolby, that are getting 15 to 20% of their global revenue. Now, we can say that's not enough, and that's fair. But to argue that engagement hasn't worked or that engagement hasn't changed Chinese people's lives, yeah, there's still a lot of problems. We can talk about the horrible things that are happening in Xinjiang right now, for example. But um, the level of personal freedom that Chinese people have today is dramatically better than it was 30 or 40 years ago. And I think part of that is due to engagement with the rest of the world. Thoughts from Victor? Uh, I, I think I think that's a modernity theory that when economy uh, GB, GDP per capita exceed ten thousand dollar, there's a, a study, a democracy study, right? The probably eighty to ninety percent of a country whose GDP uh, per capita over ten thousand will eventually transform to a liberal democracy, uh, but the uh, I think Chinese government official answer to your question is you have to separate economy versus political system. For uh, techno uh, technologically uh, to be more similar to US, absolutely yes. They want to be as advanced technology as possible. Economy, do you want to be a, f a free, full uh, market economy? Yes, but with certain conditions. Uh, I think China need to have uh, state-owned enterprises need to, like uh, Ken said, the government control the financial system. Uh, it's, so it's not going to be a fully uh, uh, econ uh, market economy. But as to the political system, no way. So that's, I think that's official answer from Chinese government. Uh, I'll ask another question. We'll open it up to, to all four. Uh, again, by way of two very quick stories. Last time I was in China, I stopped at the U.S. Embassy, and they gave me some talking points. They said, if you have the opportunity to say a few of these things, why don't you go out and use the word reciprocity? So I dutifully uh, was in uh, Chengdu and gave a talk at a university, and I used the word reciprocity, and I talked about just using the lines given to me by the U.S. Embassy, how uh, there had to be a fundamental reset in U.S.-China relations and so on, and there was an emerging consensus that the deals that had been cut weren't very good deals. One of the students stood up and said, well, why shouldn't we set the rules? This is China. If you want to do business in China, you do business according to our rules. So I'd ask for your response to that attitude. And also, my last visit to Washington, I met uh, with the head of the China desk of the National Security Council of the White House. And he asked me to communicate something. So this is not confidential. He said, you should go out and you should tell people this, and so I dutifully, you know, people say, go and say these things, and I have an opportunity, so I say these things. Uh, he wanted uh, it to be known that there is a change in Washington. If you participate in a talent program, even if a few years ago that was legitimate, it now makes you suspect. He said, every opportunity you have, tell people, if you sign up for one of these Chinese talent recruitment programs, it will make you a target of official U.S. investigation. I said, let me just make sure I repeat this back, because a couple of years ago, that was okay. And before that, it was encouraged. He said, yes, that's right. It's a policy change, and you don't have to take my word for it. Department of Energy now has new regulations. You work in a federal lab, you join a Chinese talent program, that's it for your career. So two quick stories, your responses, a a any of the panelists. I'd just quickly volunteer this notion of reciprocity. Of course, when China joined the WTO, it wasn't about reciprocity. It was about linkage. So we asked China to open its market to agricultural products, and, uh, uh, and you know, we, they would exchange something else. Maybe it was uh, lower tariffs or intellectual property protection. And so, so reciprocity is, 
I think what we're really saying is the current deal is unfair. Uh, 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 you know, China duties are higher in China than on, on U.S. products, uh, and uh, uh, China has a different system. But this uh, this other question of um, uh, you know the, the fundamental unfairness, I think we also have to realize this goes a little bit back to Andy's point. You know, when China joined the WTO, the expectation, at least in my little world, was gee, it's a communist country. They don't protect property rights. They don't protect intellectual property rights, uh, and that's still you still hear that narrative. It's written by many, written down by many scholars in different books as well, which should probably be pulled off the library shelves, because no one expected that China would embrace these concepts as a tool of industrial policy. Uh, that is utterly unexpected. There was no other socialist or communist country in the world that said. I'm going to have a five-year plan about patents. I'm going to have a five-year plan about trademarks. I'm going to talk about what I'm going to do with the courts. I'm going to have a talent program on that. So this is a, a totally different world out of the ken of our expectations and out of what was in the WTO. Maybe we do need to renegotiate it, but that's not about reciprocity. That's about coming to up, dealing with something that was not addressed at China's WTO accession. Yeah, and, and maybe I'd start by saying one of the difficulties we, that China creates for itself is they haven't rebranded. They need to stop calling it the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> <laughs> because it gives people the impression that it's a communist country. And it's one of the most entrepreneurial places in the world. Um, I tell people that after living in Shanghai for 15 years, I moved to Berkeley. <laughs> and I am sure there are more people who believe in Marxist-Leninist theory in my neighborhood than there are in all of Shanghai. <laughs> but more concretely, China has created an economy which is based on markets. It's based on private property rights. And the only way that that economy continues to grow and remains successful is if they play by our rules. So I think the, and I think they know that. And the protections, as you've said, have improved dramatically. The question is, how quickly do they move? And how much do they provide equal treatment to our companies along the way with their companies? So for me, all of the issues that are being bandied about, about what the Chinese need to do on state-owned enterprise subsidies or intellectual property rights would all be fixed if we return to the basic principles of the WTO about market access. Because if American companies and German companies and Japanese companies get equal access to the markets, my view is all the other problems will be resolved over a reasonably short period of time. Because I, I, I think you would agree that protection of intellectual property rights has improved a lot in China because Chinese have realized that it's hurting themselves. When I first started talking to Chinese officials about this, the response was what? Bill Gates and Disney don't have enough money? Now they understand that the reason they don't have a well-developed pharma industry and software industry and music industry is largely because Chinese companies are stealing from other Chinese companies. So it's in their own interest to do this. And so it's really about how do we use our leverage to get them to move a little bit more rapidly and to make sure that as they make progress, we get, our companies get to participate in that rather than they're off in this you know, communist system that has nothing to do with our system and it's a clash of civilizations as some people want to portray it now. So let's talk about the man in the White House. Uh, is this just the president? Liberal commentators now have recently come around, and some have said that even though they don't like the way Trump does what he does or may disagree with him on other issues, one of them said, at least on China, he is directionally correct. That is, uh, is there now bipartisan support across the aisle from politicians of every background to get tough? How important is President Trump to all of this? Buck? So, um, besides being an American, I have to confess I'm a Republican, and, and, as, and as a Republican, uh, I, you know, I, I believe in free trade, and, and a lot of what uh, Trump has suggested is we're closing down markets. Instead of, again, instead of opening access for everybody, 
restricting our access, access to our markets, so tit for tat. And that's, you know, that's, that's not the Republican mantra. That's the Democratic mantra, protect American jobs. So, um, so, so you, you, you think it is the I president. think it's crazy. Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> there, there you have it from an American and a Republican. All right. Uh, other thoughts? Is it, is it well, well, I just, coming uh, from the White House? This is an observation. When you have Chuck Schumer saying to Donald Trump, Go, go ahead, you know, go, go forward. Uh, uh, and you had a bipartisan passage of export control and foreign investment restrictions you, practically unanimously back in August, and where China was clearly the target. This is, cannot be viewed as a Trump-only phenomenon. I mean, some of it is due to an ill-informed electorate that's equally ill-informed on China as it is on free trade. But I think there's a durability here that we have to deal with. There's a new normal, which will probably last beyond Trump. So we'll now open the floor to questions from the audience. And I promise not to do what law professors do, which is to say, that's a very good question. What do you think? <laughs> so, yes. Uh, my first question is that you guys are very eloquent in terms of uh, you know, I, my Yes, uh, and just a reminder, uh, this is on the record. It is being recorded, and it will be streamed by Asia Society and Committee 100. So just uh, be aware uh, if there's something that you don't want either the American government or the Chinese government to be aware of, please don't say it in this forum. Okay. Uh, I want to maybe I even identify myself. My name is Stan Kuang. I'm from the University of San Francisco. So in case they need that information. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, you guys are very eloquent in terms of talking about Chin America in terms of all the historical facts. I'd like to see what the panel is talking a little bit with the whole bipartisan issues that all of you have been talking about. What do you think the China issue would look like when the whole election of 2022 coming along, and how do you see the two parties going to use that as a stage for trying to drum up the support? Thank you. That, that's great. What, what do the next two years hold? We now have dozens of candidates running for president. Will this get better? Will it get worse? It, it's going to get worse. Um, <laughs> the, I think it was a, a two elections ago. There was a there was a famous there was a famous commercial. Um, I think it was a Democratic commercial that talked about and the, and it was um, forget I forget the whole sentence, but it was it was it was um, a looking back. It was fifty years in the future, looking back, and basically China had bought the U.S. I don't know if you remember that commercial. So and it was it really was a Democratic fear mongering commercial. I believe it was a Democratic commercial. And if Democrats are going to do it in, you know, I think it was, again, two elections ago, what's going to happen now with, with Trump and his nativism really stirring up, you know, sort of the loss of American jobs, the, the fear of China, Chinese growth, as well as the fear of immigration? So I think all those are, 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 are leading up to, I see it, a, a, a pretty, it could be a pretty nasty scene on both sides. Actually, optimistic that there's going to be a trade deal in in the coming months, uh, because I think that the calculus for President Trump that led him to start negotiations, which have been running at a breakneck speed since the beginning of the year, that he needs a deal to get reelected, are still there, and and I'm I view the recent meltdown as tactical. But while I'm optimistic about that, I'm very pessimistic about the future of U.S.-China relations over the next decade. And I think it's definitely a bipartisan problem. And as I said earlier, I don't think it reflects the views of most Americans outside of Washington. And I think it's really important that our elected officials know that. And one of the distressing things to me is I speak to a lot of American companies that are doing business in China, and I ask them how they feel about the current state of relations and where it's going, and they're all generally pretty unhappy with it, even if they have disputes with the Chinese government where they'd like U.S. government support. So I asked them, well, are you speaking out? Are you talking to the White House? Are you talking to your congressmen and senators about this? And 
Are you writing op-eds for the local papers? And it typically gets very quiet. And I think it's really important uh, for any of you who are politically active to make sure that the representatives you support know how you feel about this issue. Because I don't think that message is getting through to Washington. Other questions uh, from the audience, yes. And, and feel free to identify yourself if you would like, but uh, don't feel that it's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Joe Wong. I'm with the AD20 PAC. Uh, I appreciate all you, your, your ideas and your knowledge, and I'm sure there's a lot of consensus among this room that uh, we're talking about the correct issues. My question is, before the next election, all this is going to be dumbed down to sound bites. So people can, how do you educate the public, general public, about the seriousness of these issues and the intricacy? Because it's all going to be sound bites. So how do, how do we do that in the democracy? So if not the word reciprocity, what word? You know, I tried that word in Beijing. I just follow scripts. And whenever I said reciprocity, the Chinese officials to whom I was talking would say, that's a Trump word. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what is the soundbite from any of the four? And, and none, of, none of us up here is running for president, I can assure you. <laughs> I'll just say it's extraordinarily hard because he's running, on, or both parties to a certain extent are running on fear uh, uh, and, and they're not very factually uh, driven. Uh, 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 and, and for that reason, I see it, it, it as being extremely difficult to pull out of this. And all this discussion about China's technological edge, you, this has hardly been a Sputnik moment in the U.S. Uh, we don't see massive amounts of money going into STEM education. Uh, I think no matter how you feel about the Chinese physicists and, uh, 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 or, or meteorologists, uh, the fact is we are highly dependent on a diverse ecosystem, and these people are irreplaceable. And they, they, they are leading so many of the Fortune 500 companies and so many of the startups. Uh, and I don't see this huge surge of American you know, citizens of any color uh, are rushing to study uh, in, 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 in STEM. Uh, so, you know, there's only so far you can go, but for, for, to an outsider, it's pretty easy to see China writ large as a scapegoat for a whole bunch of problems, and until the U.S. really takes ownership, and this could be done in a positive way uh, if someone wanted to. I don't think it's a matter of forgiving uh, student loans, but it's getting people enrolled in STEM faculties and re-energizing our, our, our scientific base, including fundamental research, then I think we'd have some momentum and recapture some of our, our pride. But otherwise, it's very hard to counter fear. What, what's the slogan? Um, I just think uh, that Mark just illustrated why this is going to be a hard slog, because it's really hard to reduce this to a bumper sticker. Um, how about, um, do you hate China so much you want to pay double at Walmart? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go with that until we get something better. I saw a question uh, from the side here. Yes, sir. Uh, I wonder if we're not dealing with a more fundamental issue that was alluded to by Ken, uh, but not discussed. And that is, I suspect that there are many in Washington who look at the factors that made the United States such a dominant economic, technological, and military power. And look at China 20 or 30 years from now and believe China's just going to have more of all of those factors, except perhaps agriculture. At the same time, they see a lack of will to deal with the internal problems that might make us compete effectively. Um, the unwillingness to pay taxes, proposals to drop the R&D budget when you just want to do the opposite, deal with the fact that 17% of our children are living in poverty and will never participate in STEM and things of that sort. So there is, on the one hand, the sense of a major competitor that could supplant us as the world's leader. 
and the lack of will to really face up to the internal problems. So let me turn that into a very short question. Will China take over? Whenever I visit China, I realize my mother was right. I should have paid attention in Chinese school. <laughs> Buck? I, I, first of all, it's the wrong question. The, the right answer is, can the United States maintain its dominance in the, US, in the world? And the answer is no. I mean, the answer is no. It, it, I think, and that's the thing that neither party will openly admit Okay, and until you admit that, can you create programs to address the issue? And I think, it, and, and realize it is a problem. As you say, there, there are no urgent, no urgent, compelling programs to address the issue. That's because you don't admit the issue. You're um, saying it will be a multilateral world, as the uh, international relations experts would call it. Well, you know, uh, if you're looking at 50 years from now, I mean, if the U.S. is not number one, the U.S. could still be a very important factor and key in a range of sectors. I mean, a, in a pluralistic world, uh, uh, it's possible to thrive and do extremely well. I mean, Switzerland has a higher standard of income than, than the United States, and it's a far smaller country, and no one worries about the Swiss military too much. Uh, so, 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 you know, so there, 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 there is a problem with this notion, you know, well, we'll send out the Abraham Lincoln, and we'll fight wars in North Korea and, and the South China Seas and, and, and with Iran, et cetera, and that we have unlimited... Uh, resources. We don't have unlimited resources. We never have. And I think, you know, Jack Ma is right that when he spends a trillion dollars plus on wars, it's going to come out of some part of your budget. Uh, I think a lot of Americans don't want to recognize those limitations. But uh, that doesn't mean that there isn't tremendous potential in this country. Uh, uh, we still, I mean, if you look around, I, I'm, a, I'm an, an expat from, from Washington, D.C., but if you look, I moved here a year and a half ago, you look around the diversity on the, and the enterprise in this part of the country is remarkable. Uh, and it, it is envied by the world, including in China, which is trying to make its own uh, San Francisco Bay out of the Zhuhai Pearl River Delta Bay uh, area. Uh, 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 and, and, and I think there's, there's still tremendous tremendous potential if we wised up to that, uh, uh, that we, we can be great again without necessarily wearing the same color hat. <laughs> Thoughts from Victor? I think if you look at the history where sort of a number two uh, challenge number one, uh, there's only one peaceful, successful uh, succession, which is U.S. succeeded the uh, British. Uh, I think part of the reason is uh, the two countries have the same value system, same system. Uh, but even though there's a lot of uh, friction, uh, uh, when Monroe Doctrine in, in the Latin American uh, trying to get rid of uh, European powers, uh, uh, it happened that uh, Britain was using uh, offshore uh, balance equilibrium strategy, they were also supporting to get rid of a French power, uh, uh, Spanish power. So it's kind of a coincidentally that the two country, number one, number two, have the same uh, interests uh, together with the same uh, value system. So uh, the other uh, incidents, whether it's uh, Germany challenge uh, British or US or Japanese challenge US, all had the brick wall. That uh, leads to the Thucydides uh, trap, right? I think, it, uh, uh, I think it's very likely Chinese GDP, total GDP, will exceed US if China can maintain even 5% or 6% uh, annual growth. Uh, U.S. Uh, last quarter was 3.2, was historically high. Uh, normally, it's like 2%. It's a simple math. Uh, if you extrapolate for next 20 years, you can see where when it will be crossed, right? Uh, with the more money, China, China can definitely, will definitely build more uh, military power. Uh, so the question is, uh, I think U.S. today is uh, felt threatened by the number two. So uh, uh, the, the question is how can number two uh, make sure number one was not uh, fell threatened, right? Uh, 
to become even existential threat. Uh, I, th I think that's where the problem is. Uh, because the two countries, uh, like we all agree, have a totally different political system, uh, even uh, different uh, value system. And uh, so uh, how can we reconcile this uh, major gap as wide as Pacific Ocean? That's the challenge uh, to in front of all of us. Nobody wants war because these two countries Whatever, even the, the regular war will have a major, major uh, 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 negative impact to the rest of the world. I, I think that's the major challenge uh, we, we need to resolve in the next uh, few years. I see two hands uh, in the front here. In, 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 in the front here, two, two, two hands in the front. Uh, thank you for uh, your uh, your opinions. I think it's quite uh, enlightening because you have been able to say in a very articulate way a uh, different aspect about political economy, even citizenship. So I, I, I happen to be blessed with uh, you know third generation. My father, my grandfather came to the United States in the 1930s. He's a leading scholar, went back to China to teach. My father came the first wave within scholar from China, and I came elementary school in the 80s and high school in the 90s. I went to China for middle school and on and on. So I last about eight years. I traveled to China over 30 times for a certain company. I, I think it's more deeper. I think it's not, China is not very dogmatic. If you look at Chinese history, last thousand years, you went through four purges. And um, so if anyone had been born in China a thousand years earlier, be actually be alive today, the probability is very low. And so, so there's... But for the other side, on the U.S. side, you know, Magna Carta, you know, the entire idea about democracy of men are created equal, it started with British and also it's, just, it's the Western, it's in the Western DNA. So I think the U.S. and China problem is actually having fundamentally definition of power. U.S. was blessed with idea by the founding fathers, power is self corrupts absolutely. We have, have to use a system to contain it. So that's the U.S., I believe, the U.S. entire political system and how we think about it uh, in our DNA. On the China side, sorry. So let, let's, let's bring it to a question. Go ahead. So I, I want to just put this out because I think um, I want to hear you, uh, your understanding about fundamentally, not about dogma at come this country or what is, do you think, the hardcore difference between U.S. And China, how right. they think about uh, what? Great question. What is the heart of the conflict here? I, I heard someone in the audience say cultural difference. Is this a cultural conflict? For, for me, it gets back to some of the things we were talking about before, which is how do we in the United States want our relationship with China to look like in the coming decades? Are we willing to accept that we're likely to have to share power as opposed to try and stop China from joining us as king of the hill. Um, and if that's the case, how do we use the authority, the leverage that we have to keep pushing China to evolve in a direction that means that if we're sharing power, we're doing it in a constructive way, not in a, uh, a conflictual way. But I don't think, I, I don't hear anybody in our government who is, talking about that, and I think it's close to impossible for an American politician to acknowledge that we might have to share power. Um, I certainly don't think it's a cultural difference, because uh, the places that preserve Chinese culture the best is Taiwan, much better than mainland China. Uh, for anybody who, including myself, who were born and raised in China, when you go to Taiwan, you really feel, you know, the authentic Chinese culture because where, you know, Taiwan was not uh, subject to the cultural revolution who trying to eliminate all the Chinese uh, or all, all the traditions. So does U.S. has a problem with Taiwan? No, right? So it's not a cultural problem. And uh, 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 ideological difference, like Andy said, China... It's not a USSR. It's not a sort of a uh, 
uh, typical sort of a communist party. And I don't know how many people are, are believing in communist party uh, doctrine. Uh, so, but, but, but uh, uh, China certainly today is in the Western standard as can be categorized as an authoritarian country. But US can deal with the authoritarian countries too. I mean, it's, I, I forgot which president said, right? He's the son of a bitch, but it's our son of a bitch. Uh, so uh, so that, I, I don't think these are the major problems. I, I think uh, if we can resolve one issue, which is the rule of law, if a China can adopt the rule of law. Today, China, I wouldn't say it's completely uh, ruled by law. It's kind of a transitioning from rule by law to rule of law country because rule of law is to the internal intrinsic interest of China and Chinese people, such as protecting intellectual property, right? And if China can successfully transforming itself to a complete rule of law country, you can still preserve the current political system you know, everything, uh, authoritarian, what, what have you. In that way, at least you can deal with the outside world much easily, much more, uh, with much less uh, conflict. So I think uh, it's to everybody's benefit, uh, especially to China, to Chinese people, to transform the country to a completely rule of law country. Just, just a, a small addition to that, I mean, in the last, say 40, 40 years, actually they've been similar but not as, not as much um, economic threat from Japan, similar things happen, as well as Germany and to, 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 to some extent. So you see this anytime there's economic threat to, to American leadership, something like that comes up. Uh, we, we're just about out of time. So what I'm going to do is I see four hands in the center and one on the side. That's five questions. In one sentence, ask your question. I'm going to bundle them all together, and we're going to combine with the closing. So we'll start over here with this gentleman who's had his hand up. If uh, So in one crisp sentence, a question. So your sentence has to end with a question mark. Yes, sir. Um, thanks, everybody. I think So I, I agree that a lot of it is part of the unknown. One People sentence question that, mark. With the, the media today is sensationalism being, in my mind, the problem. How do we get past that in the sense of Great Americans question. accept what they hear? Yeah, media sensationalism. All right, so I'm going to bundle five of these together. All right, and then over here, yes, uh, yeah, can, 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 we, can we get the mic over to the center as, as soon as possible? Thank you. Media sensationalism. Thank you. I always remember a quote that if goods and services are crossing borders, troops are not, right? And we thought talked about the bumper sticker. What is the slogan? I think about... Power with okay, versus, versus power with versus power over. How do we do that? All right, sharing power. Okay, if you could hand the mic. Uh, do you think that um, part of the problem comes from our government and business leaders not dealing with the post-industrial um, economy and that the technology that we know is coming, we don't know where that's going. So are we okay. transferring all that fear? Is this about the post-industrial economy? Yes. If you could hand the mic, and then we'll get the mic back to you, sir. And then you'll all, we'll go right across, and we'll take all these questions, all right? Of, um, this question for Andy and also Buck. And of three places, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, Contrast to China, which of these places you are the most comfortable with? Okay, all right. Which of those three places uh, are you the most comfortable with, which are culturally similar to China? Last question, this gentleman in the back in one sentence, and then we'll just go all the way across, and you have one minute. So you don't have to answer all five questions, but if you would uh, sure. answer at least one of them. Yes, sir. Okay, so um, what I haven't heard is is Xi Jinping rush, uh, ushering in a new regime, and how does that figure in the calculus of this? All right, uh, the counterpart to, is it President Trump, is it President Xi? All right, so we'll start here with Andy. You get one minute, and we'll wrap up. 
You may pick any of them. So that was media sensationalism, power over versus power with, post-industrial economy, do you like Singapore, and is it President Xi? Yes. <laughs> no, go ahead. Um, all those are great questions, and I think that for me, what we need to focus on is how do we change the narrative? How do we change the conversation that's going on now? Because what I see mostly in the media and from our politicians is the wrong conversation about China. I don't see any evidence that the Chinese Communist Party is trying to, for example, export its ideology. Uh, I don't see any evidence that we have to deal with a new threat because they're Chinese. And when it comes to technology, this is the same thing we've always been dealing with. For example, when it comes to telecommunications, we've never protected our secrets by protecting the pipes. It's too difficult. Back in the old days, the Soviets would send submarines down to type into, tap into the uh, cable under the sea. We've always protected it by end-to-end -end encryption and taking care of our own security, which we've not been doing. And so we need to clean up our own act together and then deal with the China that is really out there rather than the China that we think might be out there. Uh, to answer Ruth's question, I, I think that the post-industrial uh, internet, uh, artificial intelligence certainly make things more complicated because uh, even uh, we as uh, sort of a people in the myth, uh, thick of the industry trying to figure out uh, what's the impact to the society uh, and how or whether you can apply to the military. For example, the next war break up into two countries might well, well be a cyber war, right? And how would that affect uh, both countries? And, and uh, maybe 50 years later, and uh, any war will be necessarily uh, two uh, uh, group of robots fighting against each other. So, uh, so I think certainly uh, this uh, makes this whole relationship much more uh, complex. Uh, Ruth, I'll answer it a, a slightly different way. Um, it has to do with really growing the middle class, has to do with growing the wealth of the middle part of the country. If you look at China, the imperative is to grow the middle class. You know, and, and, and by doing that, essentially, you're going to grow the economy, you're going to grow its GDP greater than the United States. That's imperative. In the United States, same sort of thing. It's the question of what, what's happening to the middle class. It's shrinking, and they're looking for solutions to grow that part. So it's really trying to do the best thing for both, essentially, the middle class, uh, both in China and the U.S., and that's the conflict, is, is that right now it's hard to do both. So um, I like Singapore and Taiwan very much. <laughs> <laughs> and Hong Kong. And I particularly like how the people of Taiwan are very fond of using Zheng Yu and referring to Chinese poetry. But what I really want to say is that this, this Thucydides trap, I sometimes wonder whether this is a problem for the West and not a problem for China. China has its own vision of its imperial glory, which did not necessarily mean one major power fighting another. It's about face. It's about recognizing China's accomplishments. It's quite different from the kind of thing that went on between uh, the UK and, and Spain or, or the US and Germany. Uh, and, and to a certain extent, this gets back to the media point. If the media wants to sensationalize our decline uh, and, and China's rise, and, and if that continues as a common narrative with few dissents, and that's not a very promising future for bilateral relations because we are uh, beholden to our Thucydides trap. Uh, uh, and in the process, one of my great fears is that we will also be a traitor to our own values. What are those values? Rule of law, a WTO system as imperfect as it is that provided a way to resolve disputes that was based on a bargained process. Uh, now we have a president who says, well, 10% Trump, 10% uh, tariffs, maybe 25% tariffs. Uh, we haven't been paying much attention to what's happening in Xinjiang, at least this administration, and some of the human rights issues, which are also very important. Uh, and also, that means our own competitiveness and entrepreneurship and science education and values. And if, and if we ignore those uh, for the sake of uh, our own bitterness, our own sense of decline that we somehow cannot remediate, then we really have a serious problem. 
So I'll close with an optimistic note. Uh, since the founding of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, America has stood as that shining city upon a hill that beckons the world over to so many of us, strangers from a different shore, wherever our ancestors or we came from. That phrase was borrowed by John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan. May America remain that shining city upon a hill. You've been a great audience. Please join me in thanking our four panelists. Thank you so very much. Many thanks to Asia Society. Thank you.